Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this first debate on campus organized by SCOP. SCOP is the national platform of non-government organizations working in the field of international development, humanitarian aid, and global citizenship education. My name is Rodrigo Fajouz. I am Secretary General of SCOP. And my role today is to facilitate this debate about migration and development. Migration and development go hand in hand for as long as humankind exists. More so when one considers the relationship between failed development and forced migration. But also when we think of migration as a contributing factor to improving the lives of many. Not just the migrants themselves, but also their home community, as well as that which is receiving them. During this debate, we will be, fo be focusing on this relationship between development and migration, whilst also debating issues related to the inclusion of migrants in Malta. SCOP's guests for today's debate are Ahmed Bogri, Director of the Foundation for Shelter and Support for Migrants, François Mifsud, Lecturer at the Faculty of Education, and Lorna Muscat, Project Development Manager at SOS Malta. Something about the panel. Lorna is an experienced professional in project management. She works comfortably in three languages. A skilled strategic thinker with an excellent track record in project development, monitoring, and evaluating. Policy analysis for the formation of advocacy strategies and institutional fundraising and institutional funding management for multi-partner programs. She specializes in Latin American politics and development, specifically Brazil. As I said, she's fluent. Obviously, her, her mother tongue is English and uh, Spanish and Portuguese, although she does understand some Maltese, I believe. Anything. <laughs> Keen interest, her, she has a keen interest in relevant development areas, including urban poverty, such as housing, infrastructure and employment, youth, new media and its use for advocacy, economic and social rights, including the effect of social protection on poverty reduction, HIV, advocacy and prevention, rural livelihoods, access to land rights, and the Catholic Church and development. Ms. Muscat is presently working for SOS Malta as a, project, as a project development manager. Ahmed Bougri is the founder and CEO of the Foundation for Shelter and Support to Migrants. He arrived in Malta 27 years ago, and in an article that The Guardian published in 2016, he said that he was one of the three black people in Malta at the time. <laughs> FSM was established in 2010 and has provided adult education, employment, residential and support programs for almost 4,000 refugees and asylum seekers from over 20 nationalities at the Marsa Open Center from 2010 until September 2015. During this time, FSM developed a non-violence model for service provision addressing infrastructural and managerial aspects of social change while empowering both residents and workers at the center to participate in the processes. Education and social programs were tailor-made and focused on achieving integration goals by addressing the needs for acquiring and improving skills that are important for employment. FSM is a member of the Mediterranean Migrant Network the Africa-Europe Development Platform and Scope. Francois Mifsud is a lecturer in the Faculty of Education at the University of Malta. His area of specialization is inclusion and access to learning. In January of this year, he helped in the organization of the silent walk Solidarity with Migrants. I wanted to start um, just with a, a quote from the IOM Director General, William Basis Swing. Our message is blunt. Migrants are dying. Who need not? It is time to do more than count the number of deaths. 
it is time to engage the world to stop this violence against desperate uh, migrants. I don't think we can start any form of discussion about migration without thinking um, about the, the, the huge number of people who year in, year out, um, lose their lives while trying to seek uh, a better future for themselves and their loved ones. Something which obviously we in Europe take for granted. These are the, the numbers from uh, 2014 till uh, September, till August uh, of this year, provided by by um, The numbers speak for themselves. I don't think I can really comment about about these numbers. Some further facts. We have seen a percentage, a high percentage, of unaccompanied minors um, on the move, that is, uh, children until the age of 18 on the move. Has, it has drastically increased. And the main reasons for forced migration, civil wars, food and security, bad governance, persecution, various forms of social uh, injustice. Something which we I don't think we're so aware of, um, especially uh, in Malta, is that migrants actually move to a neighboring country. Europe is not the first choice of migrants, but the neighboring country um, is the first choice, obviously, uh, with the hope that one day it will be easier to return uh, home. Ahmed, I will start um, with you to give us your thoughts about the, the issue of migration and development. And we had that question, who pays the price? Thank you, Roderick, and good evening, everyone. Um, whenever we talk about migration, of course, the development component must be explored. We do know that there is a direct link between migration and development. That is undisputed. In fact, this year, the UN is going to adopt, or the, the UN is going to gather in the UN session this year and December, the adoption of two global compacts. One compact on refugees and one compact on orderly, safe, and regular migration. And this has come out from what we call the SDGs, when the United Nations recognized for the first time that migration is a symptom caused by lack of development. And so the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted in a way that no one will be left behind. And so, many times when people look at migration, they would distinguish between refugees like Syrians or other people and economic migrants. And they use the term economic migrants to say, these are not necessarily traveling because they are forced, because it is convenient to say so. Of course, it doesn't mean that everyone who is on the move wants to move. And one of the reasons that I want us to, to talk about this evening is, especially within the European context, is the lack of safe opportunities for people to travel. When you are living in Africa and you apply for a visa to come to Europe, it's almost impossible. I can give you an example of persons who live and work in Malta. I know a doctor, a Nigerian doctor, who came from Hungary and she works here in Malta. She's married to a doctor in Nigeria. She has been here for nearly three years. She applied for a visa for her husband to visit her and the visa was denied four times. The hospital in Nigeria and the health superintendent in Nigeria gave a guarantee and the Maltese authorities refused. This is just one example. I know many. And people take the irregular route because they have no 
or very few chances of traveling into other countries through legal means. Which means that most migrants who are forced to leave for reasons other than conflict, even those who are coming from Somalia, Eritrea, and uh, Sudan, but let's say, let's take Sub-Saharan Africa. I come from Ghana. And in Ghana, many young people would sell stuff to sell to go to Europe. Why? Because the educational system in these countries have failed. The small economies are dependent on European, on European trade policy. So for example, I was in Ghana recently and I found that people buy chicken from Holland because it is cheaper to buy chicken coming from Holland than to grow a chicken in Ghana. It's very expensive. The EU trade policy dumps. Nigeria receives rice as aid from the EU. Now the EU doesn't grow rice and yet it gives Nigeria rice as aid. Last year there was a research carried out by the African Union headed by Thabo Mbeki, the former president of, of, South, uh, South, of South Africa, and they looked at the area of the mining sector in terms of illicit transfer of funds into the EU. And they found that within the mining sector alone, tax evasion by multinational corporations, including European companies, amount to 62 billion euros a year. Total overseas development aid to Africa a year is 30 billion euros, double the amount. So if companies, if European companies or multinational companies in the mining sector alone, don't talk about the farming sector, don't talk about the corruption, because most companies would prefer to pay government officials and corrupt them than to pay taxes. And therefore, economies in Sub-Saharan Africa are crumbling, not because they cannot manage themselves, but because it is induced by trade policies, even within the EU itself. When you discuss about these issues, no, the EU will always say, but we... Thank you, Ahmed, for your input. Uh, Francois, your turn. I cannot disagree with Ahmed, for sure. Um, what I would like to add is kind of maybe do a little bit of a historical reality. Kind of many um, people, without knowing, are a little bit trapped within the Malthusian model of economy. Uh, Malthus, in the beginning of the 19th century, came with the idea that the more people there are, the more people you need to feed, and usually poor countries are overpopulated. And uh, he looked at the, you know, kind of um, at the geographic reality of that time, and he came up with the idea that you see places which, uh, you know, are not overpopulated are doing well, and other places which are overpopulated are doing really bad. In my view, that is wrong. That is completely wrong, because it is people who generates the economy. It is people who makes the economy. It is the diversity who generates creativity. It is the diversity that generates a more flourishing economy, a more creative way of doing things. The problem is, in my view, is sustainability. And sustainability is, it is not caused because of one migrant or because many migrants comes to Malta. It is caused because one, and usually Maltese or an EU citizen, is taking a big chunk of the cake and that is the real problem okay it is not caused by migration it is not caused by the many people who come okay and who lives in practically holes around uh, all around the island but it is caused by people who usually live in villas okay it is caused by people who are comfortably enough to take big chunks of our land who are comfortably enough to take big chunks of our resources and who dictates how we model and how we fashion our resources. And that is the problem. That is where we have to point our fingers. And not on the little person who, for heaven's sake, he's eating something really small every day, who's making his ends meet, and maybe he's paid a ridiculous salary. That is not the problem. That is not the problem. 
Thank you, Francois. Lorna. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Ahmed and Francois. And from my side, I mean, Roderick has highlighted and documented some of the uh, problems globally that, that cause migration. I mean, we need, we need to recognize now that migration is going to happen, whatever the situation. And I think that the question itself, who pays the price, should actually be turned into um, how can we benefit from migration? We need to start looking at the positive aspects of migration and how migration can actually promote development globally. Um, from, um, you know, we, as Roderick mentioned, that the actual the number of migrants globally, there are more in developing countries than there are in Europe. And this, this is something we need to keep in mind. Um, the SDGs as a, as a framework, as, as Ahmed mentioned, have already recognised some of the things that need to be done in order to make migration work. Um, increase humanitarian visas, increase the possibilities of mobility in a legal manner. Um, look at ways of allowing remittances. Remittances are one of the biggest contributors to economy in global and in developing countries. And at the, at the moment it's very difficult for people to send money, it's very expensive for people to send money back. So we need to be looking at how we're facilitating that. If we allow remittances um, with less kind of uh, the technical words <laughs> and lost on me now, but without taking the percentage and allow people to send more money back home, then we're already contributing to the, to the economy in the countries that they've come from. Um, so we need to be looking at more about how we can facilitate and allow for migration to be done in an orderly and safe manner, as we've been discussing before. Um, I mean, from my side, the, the, there are all the level, all the different levels of actors need to be looking at what they, what policies they're making, and how they um, can be doing this. At the EU level, we have EU um, the ministers and the prime ministers and the presidents making policies that just look at securitizing our borders as a means to stop migrants coming in. It's not going to happen. Uh, they're going to come from wherever they can, however they can. So just increasing border controls is not going to stop people arriving. We need to look at how they're arriving and how we can make that, say, that passage safe. Not throwing all our money into destroying smugglers' boats, because they'll just come from another route. So where are we spending our money? Okay, who's paying the price? Well, if we spend it differently, maybe we won't be paying a price anymore. We'll actually be benefiting. Um, at the national level, as Ahmed mentioned, the government needs to be looking at how it is including migrants. I mean, Ahmed went over this, so I'm not going to repeat it, but inclusion is key. If you actually allow people to become productive members of society, they won't cost you money. They will be giving you money through their taxes. So we need to be seeing how we can facilitate that as well through education, employment, all of these different things. And without a key a policy in place, without an integration policy in place, this is not going to happen. And the government so far has been, you know, spending three years telling us there's a policy. There's no policy yet. Um, and on the last level, we can't forget about the other actors, so local authorities and civil society. We represent civil society here. But local authorities are also key, as we know. <laughs> they have a role to play in including people in the community and facilitating their entry into other aspects of life. They don't, in Malta, they don't make policy on um, education or transport or but they do make they do promote cultural and uh, social cohesion within the community, and that is key for people also to to be part of the community. So we need to look at how local authorities are also addressing their policies and the way that they work at the local level, and including migrants within that. Can I add something? Um, just a historical reminder: when the THPN came about. Uh, practically the government was going to withdraw the THP and the permit. Um, we found it that it was going to cause an issue not only within the migrant community but also within the local community, the Maltese, which actually, you know, the migrant are the local community as well now. Um, and one of the issues is that practically you are causing a situation for people to hide themselves from the authority. Any form of authority or any, any institution that represents an authority. And that means education, schools, and that means health. Do you imagine a Malta, for example, if someone gets an infection or some sort of this, as a disease, whatever, something that can be infected, and they are afraid of going to a hospital or going to a clinic, what would be the repercussion of that on our society? Unthinkable. So, it, it, 
you, you see also the irresponsibility, not only towards the migrant community, but also towards the local community. Okay? So you are creating a situation where people have to hide themselves. Where instead of people being public and expressing their issues, their views, whatever, no, people have to hide themselves. That's, that's, that's a, an issue number one. The other aspect which I think we have to highlight here is also the fact that in reality, migration is as a resource. We need diversity in this country. Okay? We need diversity. And we've seen this country flourishing because of diversity. But unfortunately, and here maybe I want to just hint a little bit about it, we live in a post-colonial reality where Malta is trained, is trained, or I would say is even indoctrinated, always to look west. And west and usually in a particular direction. So the modern mi migration started coming into our islands, we started to be scared because it means that we have to be reminded that we are a Mediterranean country. We are not only an EU country. So in reality, migration for me is bringing up that shadow that we have been always trying to deny. We are Mediterranean. And we are Mediterranean people, and that is part of our heritage, that is part of our reality. And we have to befriend that reality. And I think that is one of the fears that this migration causing. Because in reality, let's say it, how it's affecting each and every one of us? Very little. And I would say even very positive. But the fears that are there, are present in our society. And we have to face them. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Lorna.